today by Mike Press, <coughs> our Programme Director of Design and Craft. And we know they're not all new designers, so hopefully this will give you some interesting thoughts to um, keep in your mind as you work through the design process <coughs> today and you uh, explore your ideas further. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Louder. Good morning. Good morning. And how are we? Are we good? Now, did you have a good time last night? Yes. Did you enjoy it? Did you have a good time in the, in the bar afterwards? Yeah. yeah. But you are invigorated, yes. You are full of energy. Because we still have two days ahead of us. We have two days ahead of us. Um, so you have to conserve some of the energy. Um, and the theme this morning, and the theme very much for a large part of today, is bums off seats and out on the streets. Um, because we want you to finish off ideating around the themes that you've been doing last night. We want you to get to the stage where you have a, a notion of what you want to explore and then go out and explore it. Because design is all about connecting with people and connecting with people's real lives. Now I've been given 10 minutes to explain to you what design is. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, why me? And, uh, well, someone's got to do it. Now, I realise that not everyone in this room is a designer, has a design background. So I'm going to give a very broad brush approach to what this design thing is anyway. And what design thinking is. And uh, design. What is design? Anyone, anyone care to share their own interpretation, their definition of what design is? It's solving problems, yes, it's solving problems. What else? Finding problems. It's finding problems. Designers are brilliant at solving problems, but you know something? They're even better. They're even better at finding what problems are. What else? Sorry? <laughs> yes, yeah, certainly for their teachers, they're very good at creating problems. Um, i tell you what design isn't. Um, design isn't rocket science. It's a lot more complicated than that because it's not science at all. And one of the things I say to my students is you've got to be really clear when you start studying design. What the difference is, what the difference is between design and science. They're completely different things and unfortunately we live in an age in universities where the two of them are getting confused um, all the time. <coughs> Let me explain what the difference is. What a scientist does is a scientist looks at the world and makes observations and compares those observations of the world with what's in their head or what's in the collective head of scientists. What's the knowledge that we have? And when I look at the world, how does it, the knowledge that we have compare what's out there? And if there's a difference, which there, of course there always is, we change what's in our heads. We change our knowledge. Okay? So it's about making observations. It's about being critical. It's about comparing our knowledge of the world with how the world is and changing what's inside us. Designers look at the world and they compare it with the knowledge in their heads of how the world should be. And they see there's a difference. And what they do is they change the world. They don't change what's in their heads. What's in their heads is the most important <coughs> thing. Because what's in their heads is the thing that actually makes design different. Makes design different from any other discipline in this university. Any other discipline that is about knowledge. Because it's about values. Values are absolutely <coughs> critical to design. Absolutely critical to designers. We have to be true to values. We have to be aware of what our values are. We need to be mindful that the pursuit of value-driven design is an ethical thing. It's bound up with responsibility. So what are those values? What should they be? Um, when we think about values, there's kind of two values which I think are crucial. In fact, I don't think they're crucial. These, ideas, these two ideas come from someone else, a guy called Nigel Cross, who's one of the most brilliant thinkers working in, in, uh, in design thinking. Just a little 
Uh, just a little thing I'm going to say at the outset. Design thinking. We often think that the idea of design thinking comes from IDEO, yeah? At the D School in California, Palo Alto and all that, all those people. Um, it doesn't actually. Design thinking is a term that was originated by Nigel Cross, who's professor of design at the Open University in that romantic place, Milton Keynes, in the Midlands of England. And he's written some absolutely brilliant books on design thinking, and he wrote them 20, 30 years ago. Uh, he, he didn't just kind of publish them uh, in, in design magazines quite recently. So you've actually got this very thorough, very lucid, very well worked through idea of what design thinking is. And he says it's about values, and he said there's, there's two key things that differentiate design. It's about imagination and responsibility. That's what this weekend is all about. It's about imagining. It's about imagining how things could be. Trying to, trying to identify <coughs> an unmet need, a problem out there, and it's then trying to design a service around that, to imagine what that service could be. But it's about responsibility. Design has always been about responsibility, whether we go back to Josiah Wedgwood, who arguably started the whole industrial design profession back in the 1780s, and his whole notion that you know, he was one of the most vigorous, vigorous campaigners against slavery. He invented the factory system, he invented marketing, he invented all these things upon which advanced capitalism is based. But he had this overriding sense of responsibility. Not only to abolish slavery, but also to improve the position of the working class in England. Um, so imagination with responsibility, it kicks off with Josiah Wedgwood, we see it going through the arts and crafts movement, Ruskin, William Morris, we see it in the Bauhaus, we see it in the eco-design movement today, we see it wherever we look in the world of design, imagination with responsibility. That is what you're going to be exercising between now and the end of Sunday. Um, and then constructive discontent. I think it's a marvellous phrase by Nigel Cross, constructive <coughs> discontent. See, basically, most designers are really pissed off. Right? They're really grumpy. At least most of the ones I know, anyway. They're really grumpy because they look at the world and they see it doesn't work very well. Right? It looks ugly. Inelegant. It's just not right. So, the normal state of mind, the normal state of being for a designer is discontent. We are unhappy with what we experience. <coughs> we are unhappy with how things work. We're unhappy with our health services. We're unhappy about political engagement. We're unhappy with how old people are treated in society and the services for them. We're unhappy about the crap the poor quality food that we're fed in supermarkets. We're unhappy about so many things. But the point of a designer is that they can be constructive about it. It's not just about being grumpy and unhappy and writing letters to the newspapers or sounding off on TV, which is all that politicians are capable of doing, is thinking, right, that doesn't work. What could work? What could work better? What's a better solution to that? How can I construct an alternative? <coughs> So designers are in the business of being discontent, but also coming up with viable alternatives. That's the other value you are pursuing between now and the end of tomorrow. Um, so when we start thinking about a design process, many of you, but not all of you, will be familiar with something like this. The design is about, first of all, it's about empathizing. That's the most important part of the design process, empathizing. As Hazel was saying yesterday, it's about seeing the world through other people's eyes. Being able to experience what other people can experience. It's a skill, it's a facility, it's a skill that we teach. It's not something that you're born with, some are perhaps naturally better than others. But it's a vital part of design education, it's a vital part of design learning. Learning how to be empathetic. And once we understand once we can see the world through other people's eyes we can we can uh, define things better there's the brilliant example if you're not already aware of it of um, what's her name name get to a certain age names are a problem you know? <laughs> and um, she was a designer I worked for a design consultancy in New York City and they were doing a project on 
uh, aging, the aging population, and the design challenges that this posed to the environment. She was a young woman, she was 24 or so, and she decided to make herself up to be an 80 year old. Okay, so she wore spectacles that blurred her vision, she had bandages around her joints to repair her movement, she actually went to a makeup artist so that she looked 80. Uh, she was wearing a wig, old clothes. And she traveled from one side of the United States to the other. And what she experienced absolutely appalled her. Absolutely appalled her. She didn't realize how unworkable the environment was. How just the simple act of getting on and off buses and paying your fare was almost impossible. She couldn't believe how rude people were, how abusive people were, because she was slow. She not only saw the world through an 80-year-old's eyes, but she felt what it was like to be discriminated against and prejudiced against. And that led to a fundamental shift in the United States in the design movement about how we design for older people. And it's led to some fantastic design work being done. So being able to empathize enables us to define, define what the issues are, what the problems are. And then, as you were doing last night, to ideate. You've still got a, a bit more work to do on that, but to develop ideas. And that's why we put this emphasis on building stuff. Because that marks us out, actually, from other areas. That marks us out, certainly, from politicians. There's an interesting debate, uh, occasional debate, but why don't politicians uh, prototype? You know, what politicians do is they're supposed to come up with alternatives, policy alternatives, and they do. They talk about it, and they write about it, but they don't prototype. You never know if something works unless you prototype it. If you actually see physically how it is going to work, and then you test it. So that's why we're putting the emphasis on making stuff and showing it to people and testing it. So that's, that is an approach to a design process. The key thing about the design process is that it's not linear. Right? One thing doesn't just lead to another. We keep going around in circles, we might go back, we might test something and it doesn't work, we have to go back a few stages, but all the time we're thinking about how we empathise. And we're trying to test our own judgment from what we know about people. From what we know about people, is this going to work? So I'm just going to finish off by, in a sense, trying to define what the basic principles of design thinking are and, and kind of how it differentiates from other ways of thinking about the world and actually enacting upon the world. And it really, it's these. It's a focus on human values. It's a focus on human values. And empathy for people is fundamental. I keep banging on about that, as, as I think most of us are, but that, that is absolutely fundamental to what we're doing, human values. The thing about show, don't tell, that's really the best way that we can test our ideas uh, and we can test whether something works. We make experiences. It's about making experiences and it's about showing good stories. It's not about explaining, it's not about telling. It's making the experience and showing a physical story to people so that it helps them imagine what's in our heads. You know, the thing about designers is they're great at imagining. The whole point of design education is to help people imagine better, more lucidly. Not everyone has the benefits of that education, right? Not everyone imagines in quite the same way. So that's why we have to be also brilliant at being able to physically tell stories to help other people imagine. And that will act as a spur to their own imagination. Because design is also about empowerment. Right? It's about empowering other people to take control and have a right to shape their own environments and places. Those of you who know me will know that I bang on about craft all the time. Craft is, is one of the fundamental qualities that lies at the heart of design. It's massively important. We see evidence of it. We see fantastic evidence in our jewellery department over there in textiles. Though that's craft defined by particular types of, of objects, but also defined by a particular way of thinking. And it's about the sensibility <coughs> towards the physical world and understanding, being able to not only recognize what beauty is, but to create it. Um, and also about how to make things. So how can we craft vision? How can we craft vision out of messy problems? As you've experienced last night, the problems that we're looking at are extremely messy, very big, like the meaning of life. Right? Big problems, messy problems. 
Your job, whether you're working on the meaning of life or whatever it is, is you've got to craft a vision out of that. You're like a sculptor with a big piece of rock, right? You've actually got to create something that people are saying, oh, yeah, wow, that's fantastic, isn't it? Yes, that comes out of the meaning of life. Brilliant. And you've got to show that to people. And you've got to then ask them how they think about it. So it's about crafting clarity. It's about embracing experimentation. Now that's a vital thing in design thinking, and I think is one of, you know, clearly one of the things that marks us out from other areas. We build to think, and we build to learn. We make stuff, we make ideas, we make propositions. And we do that because it helps us think. We do that because it helps us learn, helps us understand what we're doing. And that whole thing about trying stuff out is fundamental. Scientists do that as well, to be honest. Scientists do that as well in a slightly different way. What we're asking you to do, and that's why we keep putting these charts up everywhere, and we've given you a timeline, is we want you to be mindful of process. That's really important in, in, in design. To know where you are in the design process. To think, right, okay, we're, we're ideating, we're prototyping. This is where we are. This is how far we've got. Oh, actually, maybe we need to go back a couple of steps. Right? So to, to, to have a notion that you're in a process here, okay? you're trying to define a problem, you're then trying to explore the human dimensions of that problem, and then you're trying to develop some uh, approaches to dealing with it. Um, design thinking is about action. We do and make. We don't just think and meet. Um, so it's about doing stuff. It's very active. Again, that marks us out, say, from politics. And it's about collaboration, and, and that's why we're doing this, actually. That's why we're doing this jam. That's why we're doing this jam across planet Earth. Um, because diverse people create powerful solutions. The more diverse, the better. My own view, and I think it is backed up by empirical evidence, is that the reason that the United Kingdom is such an incredibly inventive nation or collection of nations is because we've always been open. We've always welcomed people from other countries and other cultures. We have always been multi-ethnic and multicultural, and that makes us incredibly creative, remarkably creative and inventive, and long may that be the case, that we are open to people from all over the world because the more different people you get together in a room, the better the ideas are, the better the thinking, the better the collaboration, the more powerful the communication between them. That's what our jam's all about. That's why we're linking with people all over the planet. Because we want the buzz going on here. We want ideas to be going on here. We then want to be connecting with people elsewhere in the world. We all got excited this morning in there looking at people on Skype from Aberdeen. I mean, you're getting excited about people from Aberdeen. You know? <laughs> Wait till we show you Mumbai. And uh, I think we've got, I think Ross has got some surprises lined up for this afternoon, people that we're going to be Skyping with. This thing about collaboration is vital, absolutely vital in terms of, of design. Design is an international, is a global way of thinking. And it has within it lots of diverse and different ways of thinking. We've got so much to learn from other people, from other cultures, and so forth. And in short, design thinking is about being human and being physical. Right? The most important things, actually the most important qualities. It's about being a human being, being mindful that we are a human being and we have to care about all other human beings and we have to try and understand them. And a really good way of understanding them and communicating with them is to be physical. Right? Physical communication is vital to what we're doing. Um, and finally, I think it is about thinking big. And I know, and, and that's all part of, I think, of the, the kind of ethos of the, of the global jam. Are you all aware of a news story that came out just a few weeks ago? That, that two Voyager spacecraft were launched in 1977, right, to go and survey the solar system. And they were launched in 1977 when Star Wars came out, um, strangely. And the first of those two um, space vehicles have, has left the solar system. They're now in interstellar space. Catch this new story. In. So the first human-made object is in intergalactic space. Amazing. 
And that, that this was made the year that The Clash had their first hit. I think it's awesome, frankly. Um, it's absolutely awesome. Because it's an analog bit of equipment. It's an analog device. That's the first thing in intergalactic space of planet Earth. Isn't a bloody smartphone or a laptop or, or something else with digital technology. It's analog, right? And they've actually got two gramophone records on it. So the aliens, when they eventually find this thing, they'll think, oh, gramophone records, so advanced. <laughs> and they can play all the music from, from planet Earth. They're made of metal, this gramophone record. You don't know what a gramophone record is, do you? <laughs> and um, so anyway, so as this spacecraft was leaving planet Earth, it swung round to take a photograph <coughs> of all the planets in the solar system. Right, one last photograph of, because in the frame, it could get every single planet in the solar system in one photograph. Fantastic. But then of course, there's a tortuous months when this photograph is transmitted back to Earth. And it's an analog image, made with analog equipment. So it arrives back at NASA, they got this thing, they think, right, lot of tidying up to do with this image. Right, stick it in photo, a mega version of Photoshop. I mean, they got an intergalactic version of Photoshop. <laughs> to try and sort this thing out. And so there's some, I don't know whether they're a scientist or whether they were a designer or, or photographer or something who was doing this image, and they were trying to get all the bits of dust off it, and bits of crap and static and so forth. And he was getting rid, he was blurring out this piece of dust. And then <coughs> the guy came along and said, don't, don't blur out that piece of dust, why not? Because that's not a piece of dust, that's planet Earth. <laughs> So in a photograph, planet Earth was mistaken for a speck of dust. And we, humanity, took that photograph. Are you struck by something? Are you struck by thought? Because I was. Aren't we incredibly small? Actually, cosmic terms, we're incredibly small. But we've still succeeded in taking something incredibly small and delicate I'm fucking it up. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be like that. If we think big, if we just think on the level of our planet, and let's bear in mind, it's a planet that's the size of a speck of dust. That's all that you have to think about between now and the end of tomorrow. Thank you.